Hello ladies, gentlemen, and Gothamites. It is I and Mighty Sophia here to break down for you guys the latest episode of Gotham. So, spoiler alert, um, as I will be bearing all in this review. And without further ado, let's dive into the mad thick of things, shall we? So, first of all, I sat here for about a total of like 10 seconds before I turned on my camera. I just filmed uh, my Better Call Saul review, actually, which was fun. But, uh... <laughs> So, I thought about this episode, and you know, I, I ended up watching it um, right after, you know, yeah, no, I watched the episode right after I saw Better Call Saul, which is amazing, and then <laughs> this show, <laughs> which is not that it's n terrible, but I have things I need to complain about, and I hope that you guys are okay with that. So, number one... What, what the crap is ever going on with Fish Mooney? I feel like when it comes to writing her character storyline, her arcs, it's as if the writers are flopping like fishes on the shore. Because, so I was under the impression from that very brief and intense scene that we got at the end of the last week's episode, with her and whatever dude Jack and her ship going ham, like attacking each other, I thought there was some history there. Because the way that they just kind of like went for it, it didn't make any natural, organic sense. Which, I mean, I guess that's not necessarily the hallmark of the Gotham universe, but still. And then, so she wakes up in this underworld, you know, it's some people think it's hell what whatever and basically there is absolutely no structure which i find very difficult to believe i find it very difficult to believe that only one person holds the power in this facility wherever the crap it may be one guy holds power and why because he's the only one with a blade because that's the only way that you can kill people. You can't choke them, you can't step on them, you can't knock them around, like, is, really? Really, has nobody tried that? I mean, I guess, sure, it's nice to have a blade. It kind of puts you that much further away from the action. You can sort of, I get it, but I don't. It really just doesn't make any logical sense to me that just here is this guy, this autocrat, who has the blade, he's got the knife, and then there's just everyone else. Just all the... It, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. I, I just can't fathom how that would stay that way, how that kind of social structure plays out. Um, and so, very, very stupidly easy does Fish Mooney work her way to the top by seducing the guy in all but 10 seconds and then grabbing his knife, his one source of power, and sticking it in his jugular. Okay. I mean, it could have been slightly more epic if she had to work a little bit harder to get to the top and if the guy who wasn't at the top of this whole system was such a moron. Like, <laughs> it's laughable. It's laughably ludicrous. Like, I... Just, just bless the hearts of all the thinking that has gone into this thing that is fish mooney's life and she's like i've got a plan does anybody here like does anybody have any interest in having a plan because there's like not it oh gosh it makes no sense i am just completely and utterly perplexed like she's just pulling all the i mean i guess I guess it makes enough sense for her character because she's a take charge kind of gal, but it's just not that triumphant when everyone's so downtrodden that there's really, it's just kind of chaos. So I guess she's going to galvanize everybody, give them a cause to rally around, and I, I don't know, it just seems like oversimplified in a, in a really weird extreme 
way. I mean, weird and extreme, I get, I get that's part of the territory with this show, but at the same time, it's just like, eh, eh. And then, let's see, what was the other thing that I was really pissed about? Um, also, I just think, so, we have this, these totally, like, comedic villain moments with Moroni and Falcone. They're, like, strolling through the mansion, and, uh, and Falcone is trying to convince Moroni not to kill Penguin now that he's back in town and he's got a club. It's not Club Penguin, it's just Oswald's. And, um... Anyway, so Falcone is like, well, how about I give you this dude? And then Moroni's like, oh, that's so awesome. <laughs> you know, I was just, I was expecting the two of them to have this maniacal cackle together. Like they come up to this glass room and there's like a half naked judge and this guy he was sleeping with or whatever. And it's just like, I don't know, it was just weird. You know, like that's just kind of the currency of their universe, but then Moroni reveals to Oswald himself at the grand opening night of the club that his fate is very much tied to that of Falcone's, and he has been uh, threatened by various various leaders and uh, people, people with power, but at the same time, I, I don't know, I don't know, because... Uh, because Fish was threatening to kill him, and his fate was kind of already tied with Falcone, so it's like, now the two of them are irrevocably in this thing, and Moroni's just gonna mess with him and tell them, but it's like, what exactly does Moroni have in store for Falcone? I don't know. I don't know, because I really thought that the mob war was going to explode a long time ago, and then Fish Mooney just kind of left. I guess, really, the explosive moment that we, we had, actually, was, um... What is, what is her name? Uh, the girl who Falcone killed and she was, um, planted by fish and, you know, Liza, Liza, yeah. That was kind of like the explosive, explosive moment and then it all just kind of dissipated but there's still, there's still just enough tension to keep everybody rattling in their cages but who's gonna bust out? I don't know. Anyway, so Oswald is having kind of a sad life. He goes to invite his best friend to his new club, and he is mean. And I definitely think it's major foreshadowing the fact that Penguin tells Gordon, you know, you really shouldn't be so unkind to me because one of these days you're gonna need my help, blah, blah. I just, I love the dedication that, uh, that Oswald has to Gordon. He's quite a committed, committed little crony. And uh, clearly he plays favorites because we see uh, two major supervillains uh, come head to head in the GCPD of all places. The, of course, um, highly publicized, I, I saw it on the Facebook page last week, the meeting of uh, the Penguin and the future Riddler. We got Enigma and Cobblepot in the same zone. And we see that Enigma picks up on Oswald first and kind of starts trailing after him. Tries to lure him in with a riddle. That's kind of like his litmus test of friendship. The Penguin's litmus test of friendship is like, are you Jim Gordon? Because if not, GTFO. That's basically the way that he plays this game. And I mean, to some extent, like, he, you know, he, he knows how to suck it up to people. But when it comes to somebody who's kind of, like, on his level, like Nigma sort of is in the system of the, uh, the police department, and he's a lower-level thug, you know, he... He really takes offense to someone so lowly as he is. Um, perhaps he kind of sees himself in the person of Nigma, and that's not really going to jive with him because he wants to be the cool kid on the street. And when you got a couple of future supervillain wannabes just chilling in a room, you know, it's going to be some tension. But that's kind of what I think was happening there in their exchange with um, Oswald's just immediate disdain and just shutting this guy down for really no apparent reason. I think it's because he kind of, I think he maybe sees a part of himself in this, this strange and quirky character who's kind of... Um, He's kind of a cog in the machine, and Oswald knows that's sort of where he's at for now. But the two of them shall ascend in their own ways later. So it was an interesting meeting, and I think that it was really well played. Um, Nigma just wants some friends. I mean, the guy... 
off-putting as hell, but you know, you can't put him off forever. He's he's a good time if you can you can handle the jokesteriness. Um yeah, so that was kind of interesting. Um there was like something else that really pissed me off. Oh, hi cat. Bye. Uh, about the episode. Oh, the part with Bruce. So I thought this was going to be the episode where he fell down into the bat pit and began his uh the percolation of his doom and despair and super heroicness. I thought it was all going to get started this episode. He goes into the woods, he throws some rocks, he falls down, he does something to his leg, and then he sits there, like, all day. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that was an interesting, interesting adventure. I just think it's funny that he just sort of stayed there, and <laughs> Alfred's, like, at home, watching the clock, like, he's done it again, and then he goes out, and they have a cute little pseudo-father-son bonding moment watching the sunrise, and Alfred is a badass as always, and his, ugh, oh, he, he is just the pinnacle of the show for me. Him and Oswald, they, they're my boys, they're my boys, they keep me coming back. And then, of course, so we have the shenanigans with the young Scarecrow. Now, I'm a little perplexed as to how things are going to transpire, how is he going to kick the fear serum because he's supposed to someday be using that himself and his dear old daddy-o injected him with like a super overdose and so he's still like trapped in this perpetual nightmare of doom. So I'm assuming that at some point he's going to come out of this thing swinging or appearing perhaps relatively normal having conquered this fear. So I don't know. I don't know. It's gonna be interesting to see how this severely traumatized character plays out and how, again, they're going to keep him from becoming who he is someday going to be. I think the interesting paradox about what his father, Mr. Crane, or Dr. Crane, professor, whatever, was trying to do um, is that, like, you, you defeat fear and then nothing matters. I mean, remember that quote from way back early in the season, fear tells you where the edge is and clearly this guy had absolutely no concept of it because he walked straight into bullets laughing all the way to the bank of death. And it was really just quite laughably pathetic at that point because it's like, okay, so you don't have fear and then you die. It's like fear keeps you alive. But for him, he thought that he was doing this to himself, to his son to ultimately save the human race from fear and then what happens next with all these other parts of the human soul in still intact you know without fear like you still you still have malice i think you still have anger you still have passion and then everything is just pure impulse and like it gets really weird and psychological and philosophical when you start breaking it all down but we see just how quickly Crane's life ends when he at last feels that he has conquered fear and it's really just kind of ridiculous so I'll be curious to see what happens to to his son as he's trying to recover um, I'm glad to see that Gordon is uh, nowhere near Barbara at the moment and that he and his lady friend are being delightfully awkward in the office. I swear, he was like this close to being like, I don't like girls. I don't kiss girls. Cooties. Like, he was just shy of that. Him and his whole professionalism spiel. But I think that, I think that Leslie is, um, counterbalances him pretty, pretty well. And, uh, I enjoyed Harvey's little moments in the mix too, but that's kind of the main gist of this week's episode, sort of major things. Anything that I missed, I would love for you guys to address in the comments. I will be there as soon as I can. Thank you guys so much for watching this show and bearing with me. Watch my other videos and it'll be lots of fun too. So yeah, fill in the blanks. Anything I didn't discuss, you do it and then I'll do it back to you and it'll be great. Okay? So you guys... Take care, as always, and uh, I will be back before you know it.